This is the Authentic Sex Podcast, real life conversations about sex, pleasure and relationships. I'm your host, Juliette Allen. This episode of Authentic Sex is sponsored by the Juliette Pleasure Wand. The Juliette is a premium crystal pleasure wand designed to heighten your sexual energy, increase self-love and self-pleasure, expand your orgasmic experiences and connect you to your true sexual essence. You can read more and purchase your own crystal wand by visiting my website www.juliet-allen.com. Welcome to Authentic Sex, Kate. I am so excited for this conversation. You are a dear friend and my naturopath (laughs) who has um, been helping me so much since Magnolia was born, actually. Um, So deeply grateful for you and everything that you have brought to our family and all the support that you gave us when she was born at 30 weeks. Um, And here we are. I am just excited to yeah. to um have this conversation. So thanks. Thanks for having me. Would you like to tell on us on the chat? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Um, would you like to tell everyone listening a bit about you? Like, you know, what a bit about where you live, um, what you're doing for a living, so they can learn more about why you're here. Sure. Um, so I live in Lutruita and I've been here now for probably seven years. I was a transplant from Queensland down here. And um, <laughs> poof, what I do in the world, gosh, I wear a lot of hats, don't we all? Um, my main role is mother, I guess. But after that, I've been a clinical <laughs> naturopath now for about, probably 16 years. Um, in the last seven of those years, I've been working pretty specifically in the gut health field. Um, so delving in to, gosh, there's, unfortunately, there's no end of work in that field because there's a, a lot of gut issues out there. And yeah, so that's kind of been my focus mm-hmm. um, clinically for the last seven years. But you know, alongside that, trying to uh, raise good little humans and be a, a present and good partner. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's a little yeah. bit about where I'm at. Yeah. <laughs> mm, thank you. So I, um, for those listening, I've got Kate on today to talk specifically about gut health and how that relates to our sexual health. Um, and it's an area of... Um, I. S- having a naturopath in my life has always been really important because um, my health is just one of my top values and same for Nick and we can't do it alone and we don't like going to uh, traditional doctors. So um, I've always had a naturopath and an acupuncturist to support me along the way in life. Um, And so, yeah, like I said, when Magnolia was born last, this time last year, um, Gosh, I reached out that long. to you, Kate, just for some support. It she was one yesterday. Oh one wow! Day. Crazy. I oh, know. Happy. Birthday. So when she was born, she was born. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> it was a big day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't know. That. Yeah, there was a lot to feel yesterday. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but when she was born, um at 30 weeks unexpectedly we were in the hospital system and um because she was born in hospital because she was so young and they um wanted to give her all sorts of extra added bonus um pills and drugs and all sorts as a premature baby Mm. um even though she was actually really quite healthy and um she was a she was a little fighter. Like she was just she came out crying, pink, healthy. Anyway, I didn't intend on going into this, but I am. So um, intuitive. I knew we needed a naturopath, but we didn't need any old naturopath. We needed a naturopath who specifically could help us with a premature baby, 
Now I've got about four friends who are naturopaths. So there's no shortage of um, wisdom in my community that I can, you know, draw on and, and reach out to. But I just intuitively picked up the phone and, you know, said to you, Kate, like, hey, this is what the fuck's going down. I need help. And you were just so, you were the perfect person and you helped us navigate um, all the different things that they wanted to give her and even down to like the iron supplement that was just a piece of shit that they wanted to put into her and you gave us a better, you know, offered us a different solution, a different product, um, all the things. So deeply, deeply grateful for your support and um, and then, you know, we moved on to her gut health and um, you – got us, you know, recommended that we got her gut, her poo tested basically just to see what was going on in her gut because it's just such an important yeah, thing to be on top of. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, mm. yeah, I was happy that I could provide that support when it was necessary. It's sometimes overwhelming and tricky navigating, I guess the the medical system and kind of having someone to help advocate for you and look at what's really necessary and not and with you know holding the health of the child as the most important thing. So yeah, look, um, mm. infant gut health is important. Um, given you know it can also set the mm. stage for what our gut health is like later in life. So. You know, when I'm kind of digging around in people's mm. health history and I want to learn about, you know, what trajectory has their gut been on, I kind of ask, you know, what was their birth style? Were they breastfed? You know, were they preemie? Were they on time? Those mm. sorts of things matter because it gives you a little bit of insight to potentially what trajectory their gut health has taken. Um, and quite often kind of looking at a person's background, health history, across their lifetime can tell you quite a bit about potentially where things might have um, not necessarily gone wrong but taken a different course with their gut health. So, yeah, we had a little look at um, mm. Magnolia's gut and thankfully it was looking good. And, you know, yeah, think, right yeah, closely. yeah, and, um, you know, the breastfeeding and the impact that that has on the development of the infant microbiome is really important. And so keeping that process mm -hmm. going and honouring it for as long as, as possible is an important step for maturation of the gut. And then also, you know, the introduction of solids and how and when that happens and all those sorts of factors matter. So, yeah, it's a... It's a it's a mm. gut journey from day dot, I guess, but I've got a very gut lens on life, so yeah. Mm. So <laughs> a gut lens. A gut so lens. as you may have gathered for those listening, we're going we're gonna talk about the gut. <laughs> um, because it's just so important. It's like the foundation in my opinion, one yeah. of the foundations of great health is um yeah, and you're the expert on that in my life. So Let's talk about gut health in general first and then let's move on to or potentially we'll just naturally move on to like how that impacts our sexual health. And um, in particular, I'd love to talk about candida, thrush, like the, you know, a lot of clients I see um, and women that I speak to um, experience a lot of thrush um, and it, you know, it comes and goes in their lives. And I yeah. experienced it when in my 20s quite a bit and then it have never had it since but anyway I'd love love to talk about that because I think what you have to share could change so many women's lives because you know yeah. you've got thrush you're itchy yeah. you're thrushy and it impacts our sex lives in a big way so totally. yeah um you and take the lead here let's let's go <laughs> yeah yeah you're not going to be able to um shut me out now <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, gut health, Hippocrates said that sort of death begins in the bowels. And if you think about what our overall digestive tract does for us in terms of the way that we digest, you know, assimilate and absorb our nutrients, if we couldn't do that, then the integrity of all the cells in the body is compromised, so to speak. So, you know, the 
the microbiome or the microbiota doesn't just uh, isn't made up of just bacteria. There's fungi, there's viral, there's protozoal factors to it as well. And I think the bigger concepts with the gut is that you're really looking for the, the balance and the harmony in there. Um, things like, mm. you know, there's lots of telltale signs in the body that, you know, things might be amiss with your gut health. And one of the most common things that we see in clinic is people coming going, you know, I just feel bloated all the time or I've got a lot of gas, for example. And, you know, that's probably mm. one way that when you think about, you know, the willingness to kind of, you know, be in that space to make love and, and but you're sitting there with this kind of bloated tummy or gas coming out of you. You're not <laughs> oh, really feeling it's the worst feeling. Like too no sexy. One, no one wants to fart during sex. Like it <laughs> happens, but no one wants you know, and if yeah. if you are super really bloated and fart a farty person, that's gonna impact your, totally. your sex life. Yeah. You're so not gonna feel like you're keep going. You in had the me mood. At, you had me at fart. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we could talk farts all day. <laughs> farts tell you a lot. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if your abdominal area is feeling like there's a lot of pressure there or it's distended and you're like needing to constantly unbutton the top of your pants, then that's a little bit of a telltale sign that potentially something's not right there. Another common mm. one is people who might come in with. Mm reporting that they're reacting to certain foods that they feel like they don't tolerate them as well as they could. So we kind of go on this journey of really pulling apart mm. what those symptoms are and what it could be telling us. And, you know, IBS is really, really common, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, when That's you think about... bowel syndrome, right? Yeah, yeah. And you think about everything that your microbiome mm. does for you. It helps to regulate mood, you know, um, it's involved in immunity. So it, it is, you know, central to our health. So, yeah, I, mm. I work a lot in helping to kind of unravel a little bit about what could actually be going wrong in the gut. And then we look at ways to modify our lifestyle, our dietary habits to help get people back on track. And, again, the health of the gut um, – is more about the harmony and the balance in there. It's kind of like gardening a little bit when you think about the health of the soil really determines how well your veggies or your plants grow. A little bit kind of similar in the gut. If that terrain mm. in there is not great, then you're likely to create an environment where more unfavorable microbes flourish instead of those beneficial ones. And we want those beneficial microbes to be happy because, again, they do a lot for us. There's more bacteria in your gut than there is sort of cells in your body, so it's like an organ in itself. And Yeah, wow. They say don't. there's like this kind of, you know, what I've heard is the gut is the second brain. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. There's a more serotonin production gut based than there is brain based there's a really clear link like wow. the gut brain axis that that is made up of the the sympathetic parasympathetic enteric nervous system is that link so absolutely and it's not uncommon to have people with kind of imbalance or dysbiosis in their gut be experiencing altered mood like depression anxiety those sorts of things are quite common um, so yes, another reason Imagine why you want to look people, after your gut health. people knew that. Yeah, look, I think it's, yeah, it's starting yeah. to get, the word is sort of starting to become, uh, more well known. Those types of concepts I think are filtering out. So yeah, there is mm. quite a lot of work that you can do. And I think, you know, food really is your medicine, to be honest, like, the impact mm. of things that impact mm. the gut microbiome, um, as I come across a lot, are uh, um, there's medications that impact microbiome health. Antibiotics is a big one. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Mm. Um, 
Oh gosh, there's a big list mm. I could go on, but there's there um a couple of the two that yeah. spring to mind. They're some of so, the most common ones, right? Yeah, and mm. other ones like acid inhibiting medications, like there's a whole gamut of people walking around with reflux that take, you know, acid inhibiting medication, which is really problematic for our digestive tracts. Um probably the other one that has mm. the biggest influence is diet. I mean when we take a step back and think about yeah. how much our food system is being industrialized, um, it's really a no-brainer that there's mm. a lot of people with gut health issues. You know, your body responds to how yeah. you fuel it and the quality of the fuel that you put in it. So <clears throat> dietary factors yeah. are huge in gut health. Can I just... Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to kind of, I'm just reflecting upon my own gut health and just wanted to share how when I was in my 20s, early 30s, I had a lot of um, bloating in my tummy that I couldn't figure out. Hmm. And um, I just always felt a bit like crampy and tight in there. And, you know, I tried to like go to gluten free and I, tr I tried all the things and I was vegetarian at the time and, and vegan for a year of my life, but vegetarian primarily. Um, so what that meant was that my diet consisted of like a lot of canned food and um, tofu and that was about it. And then veggies lots of lots of fruit I was never full I was always just bloated and just but but hungry but it was just a shit time really um and <laughs> um then when so obviously reflecting I'm like god my gut health must have been pretty fucked but then when I um started eating meat after like 20 years of not eating it um I started eating way more f just fresh produce and like um just kind of fresh protein basically like mm. not not no yep. not so much processed stuff and my whole all my bloating disappeared and has never ever returned like I never feel bloated and never get the crampiness nothing I can now I can eat sourdough and all the things but it's like yeah it's totally changed so um yeah, and then, uh, you know, reflecting also in that period where I was eating a lot more processed food, that's when I had more thrush. Yeah, and I any, think... Any um, <laughs> thrush, you know... What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so like as well as the gut microbiome, we've got the vaginal microbiome and that's kind of like a whole mm. field within itself as well. But when women have mm. recurrent thrush symptoms or anything like that, it speaks more to the imbalance in the ecosystem, whether it's the ecosystem of the gut or the vaginal ecosystem. So candida um, species are what we would classify as a bit of a commensal. So we know that they exist in the gut. There's quite a lot of different fungi and yeasts that are in there and they all have their own balance. But these type of microbes can be commensal which means they have their place but they can be a bit opportunistic as well which means that if your gut or like your garden your soil isn't nicely balanced then these mm. microbes become opportunistic and they start to kind of uh, over become in what we would call like an overgrowth situation and so the overgrowth of any one mm. particular microbe above and beyond what its need is in the gut kind of signifies the imbalance I guess. So candida for some mm. people is not an issue where it is to the other because it's all about the state or the terrain in the gut, which then allows that microbe to flourish. And so a healthy gut. Got it. So do we all have candida in our gut? There's like a fungal biome in there. It's not as well researched as the bacterial, but we know there's a lot of crosstalk between fungi and bacteria in the gut. I guess what we would classify as normal levels of fungi and yeast in the gut is a little bit less determinate than the bacteria, which we've studied a lot more. So, yeah, it's kind of more mm. about the imbalance, which talks about the terrain in there is not right. Okay, so... Yeah, if you've got reoccurrent mm. kind of thrush symptoms in a vaginal sense, it's more about the balance in there and things are imbalanced. And 
those types of things in balance, whether it's in the vaginal microbiome or the gut microbiome, talk more about, you know, the overall health of the individual. And that comes back a lot to what you eat. And, you know, it, mm. it makes total sense to me, Jules, that when you kind of take the processed foods out of the diet and you start kind of prioritizing fresh food that you start to feel better and that your gut microbes respond and when I'm looking at Mm. what type of diet is recommended for gut health it's not like any one thing done to the extreme it's again about balance so I'm not advocating that you all become carnivores or that you all become vegans but it's the happy medium in between where we get Mm. a variety of different foods different protein sources in the diet. So if you want a really diverse, healthy ecosystem, you need to eat a really diverse amount of food. And so as a baseline, Mm. if you kind of kept a diet diary for yourself and you wrote down everything that you ate for seven days, and then at the end of those seven days, you added up Mm. all the different types of plant foods that you ate, so different types of fruits, veggies, nuts, seeds, whole grains, legumes, etc. You would want as a baseline at least 40 different varieties going in each week as a kind of mark of how diverse mm. you need to eat to maintain a healthy ecosystem. So mm. most of my clients, when I get them to yeah. do that exercise, they're coming in somewhere around 25 to 30 in their variety per week. And so most yeah. people now are accustomed to knowing that they have to eat, you know, a certain amount of fruit and vegetables each day for their fiber intake and to be healthy, but they generally just eat the same five veggies day in, day out, or the same couple of varieties of fruit. And so we all get caught yeah, in I that. I definitely it, do. <laughs> yeah, we get we get caught there because it's easy and we kind of have our recipes yeah. that we like to cook. But what I try and encourage mm. my clients to do is to you know, look at the hierarchy of food. And what I mean by that is like, where do you put your food budget? What do you place emphasis of where you spend money and where you save money with your food budget? And I like to encourage people where possible Mm. to shop at farmer's markets, speak to the people who grow your food, look at the environment that your food is grown in because it will impact the overall nutrient density of the food. And then the, again, the impact Mm. on the body. So Going to your farmer's markets also encourages... Just like our environment impacts us, right? Absolutely. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, yeah, absolutely right. I was speaking the other day about, yeah, how our environment impacts us and our mental health and our emotional health and all the things. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a really good... No one's ever framed that for me about my food, like the environment that it's grown in impacts... Yeah. Speak to a farmer who's happy. in our body. Yeah, who cares about the food they grow yeah. and the flow and effect mm. of that. You know, I even encourage people just looking at the, the way we eat. Do we eat standing up at the kitchen bench while we're organising five different kids to pack their bags and get out the door? Or do we make a calm space where we sit mm. down and we chew properly and even giving thanks to the food that we're eating yeah. as well? It sounds woo-woo, but... There's a lot in it. So the environment in which we eat will have a big impact on how the food is assimilated as well. I have to interrupt this episode to let you know that today is sponsored by Pleasure School. Pleasure School is a monthly membership where together we study intimacy, conscious connections and how to embody our true sexual essence. Every month, students of Pleasure School access members-only educational content across a wide range of formats, including written, audio, video, and guided home study. Pleasure School is led by myself, and I'm also joined by other teachers who are pioneering in the fields of sexuality, relationships, and holistic health. This is your chance to join a unique online school like no other in the world. Learn more and join Pleasure School at www.juliet-allen.com. That's J-U-L-I-E-T-A-L-L-E-N.com. So the other yeah, thing about going nothing to... worse than just shoving a meal down your throat and then not being able... And then being like, what the fuck? That was like 
such a delicious meal and I don't even remember eating it because I was scrolling through my phone or I was trying to manage the toddler or yeah. you know work half yeah, yeah I've, I've done that even with chocolate sometimes I'll buy like a delicious chocolate and then I'll realize <laughs> I didn't enjoy that I just shoved it down my throat yeah um, yeah so it's yeah. bringing that kind of presence to eating which you know we are being encouraged to bring a lot more presence in our life in general so let's bring it to eating and let's really be Mm. grateful for the food that's on our plate and yeah our Mm. teenagers because they're so hungry they're growing they just inhale food like I'll be sitting and eating and I'll turn and look and Mm. their their plates are empty and I don't even think they've registered that they've had a meal so it's really hard to get them to slow down yeah they're ravenous most of the time yeah yeah but what i was going to say about my teenager farmers markets and things like that is that you become more attuned to seasonal produce so Mm. we can't just eat that well the industrialization of our food system and the amount of food miles means that you can go into your big shiny supermarket any time of the year and pick up a tomato and eat it but nine times out of ten if you're buying a tomato from a supermarket in the middle of winter it's not going to taste like a beautiful tomato because it's the wrong time of year so farmers markets Mm -hmm. you will be more introduced to what's available seasonally and when you start to rotate through what's available seasonally you naturally start to diversify your diet so I think yeah. that's a really yeah. good for people. You Even know. finding, you could find, um, we found a delivery service. It's a local farmer who delivers a box of seasonal fruit and veg once a week. And um, so, yeah, it's you got to get used to eating that way because sometimes the box rocks up and I'm like, oh, but there's no sweet potato or like there's no this or, you know, like what I <laughs> yep. want to – but then there's these random vegetables like radish that I haven't had for ages that I don't really love but I'm like, no, nah, it's seasonal. Like I need to roll with this because this yeah. is good. I'm getting variation in my diet rather than just buying the same stuff every week. Yeah. Yeah. And – I love the community veggie box. Like that's what we do here in the valley where we live. We've kind of like tried to have this ethos that we're not trying to source food too far from our home environment. And so I would absolutely, I absolutely put value in paying my local farmers, supporting them to grow the food. And our veg box turns up each week. And then we do another one, which is like a produce collective where you source from farmers only within our local area. And they have like a central drop off point. And that's where you can source not just fruit and veg, but Mm. meats and things like that as well, all locally and nine times out of 10 organically raised and grown. So yeah, supporting your local farmer is, is a great way that you can be investing in your health. And you know, people always talk to me about the cost mm. of food and the cost of food is through the roof. But the way I kind of explain it is I don't buy health insurance. What I do is I invest in the quality of the food and the fuel that mm. I put in my body to stay well. So, yep. yeah, we're the same. Yep. Yeah. So, so, so if someone, so um, I'm aware we have like a time you know, limit on how long we have together. So I want to just start asking you some questions based on what, I guess for me, my curiosity, but what I feel potentially um, people listening might want to understand or maybe some practical tips. Um, So if somebody's listening and they have um, identified, oh, wow, I'm always bloated or yeah, I have reoccurrent thrush. Um, or, oh my gosh, I fart all the time. That's really problematic. Um, what, what are some first steps aside from, you know, what you've shared around going to the local farmer's markets, eating, um, you know, checking out the environment, your meat and your, um, fruit and veggies are grown in (laughs) with produce. Um, what's some of the steps people can take? to begin to heal their gut Um, and let's get specific to with the thrush stuff like because you know there's going to be some women listening who are like I need to sort this out it's time what what do they do 
Generally, if you're talking about reoccurrent vaginal thrush, I think there's some dietary factors there, you know, pulling back on the amount of refined sugar and that you have in your diet is the first big step there. Um, I would probably also... Is that because the sugar feeds the thrush or the the thrush eats the sugar it's what, what's the a bit to do with that? the fact that yeah those types of sugars in the diet can in from a gut perspective as well feed those types of microbes um and again you want to be putting in food that encourages the growth of beneficial microbes and so we can go into that a bit if we have time later but if it's reoccurrent vaginal thrush i would probably the thing that needs to be considered there also is that it can be passed between partners so women always kind of Mm, bear the brunt of this but they need to consider that if they're treating themselves they may need to treat their partner as well the thing about reoccurrent thrush Mm. again is that the the state of the vaginal ecosystem will determine whether that thrush is going to just be commensal in there or whether it's going to thrive and so Sometimes What's commensal? It, what do you mean by that? A commensal means that it's there, but it's not problematic. It's a natural inhabitant, but okay, it's not it. problematic. Yeah. But when it becomes in an overgrowth, that's when you tend to get symptoms. I think a little bit of vaginal microbiome mm. testing can sometimes be really beneficial for women because they can start to identify what their community state type is. And that's um, a term we use that categorizes different types of vaginal microbiomes and some of them might be more susceptible to reoccurrent infection and things like that so taking those steps if it is a real reoccurrent problem getting a little bit of investigation done i think is a really wise thing because it can really help point you in the right direction in terms of treatment strategies um But eating probably more prebiotic foods in the diet. And what I mean by a prebiotic is a food that feeds bacteria and specifically good bacteria. So there's a whole bunch of prebiotic foods. Okay. Gosh, there's heaps. I'm not going to go into them, but you could all Google prebiotic foods and there'll be a list as long as you're armed. But what's like some, what's the top five? Like what's off the top of your head? Five prebiotic. So um, polyphenols in the diet, which if you think about foods that have that kind of deep purple, black and red pigment, so think about all your berries, for example, think about, you know, plums, grapes, cranberries, raspberries, anything that has that deep kind of purple, black or red pigment in the skin of it is going to contain polyphenols that are really beneficial for certain microbes within the gut. We all want more of those in our diet. Yep. Um, okay. Another one is getting resistant starch in your diet. And so resistant starch isn't that cool, not that sexy. Let's bring it back. <laughs> so things like you like your sweet potato What's juice, that, like potatoes? But eating them cold. Mm. So cooking mm. them and then maybe letting them go cold oh. and pop, popping them through your salad the next day. Yep. The act of cooking and letting it go cold. Why cold? Can, because it forms a type of resistant starch, which is quite beneficial in the gut. You can do it with any type of whole grain or legume. So, you know, if you want to cook your teak peas, let them go cold and pop them through your salad in the next day or cold rice, those sorts of things. Resistant starch mm. has its place mm. in our diet along with our polyphenols. So prebiotic foods most of you are probably already eating quite a few in your diet but are not aware of it but the reason they're important is because they provide fuel or food for these microbes within our ecosystems that we want to thrive so it's kind of about selectively feeding up the right microbes when we increase the short chain fatty acid producing microbes in our gut it affects the overall ph of our gut and it affects the the terrain which then these microbes that overgrow naturally come back down to their normal level and balance if that makes sense right so yeah okay so cutting out sugar processed sugar what about something like um in my cooking i use monk fruit 
what's your thoughts on monk fruit sweetener yeah as alternatives yeah i think you know sweetness has a place on our palate and in our diet but in balance with everything else um you know honey honey is a wonder food it provides you sweetness so does fruit i think monk fruit Again, I don't have an issue with it as a sweetener, but it's all about bringing it in the balance. And so, you know, people who go into some of the chemical artificial sweeteners that eat bucket loads of it in their diet because it's, you know, it's not actually a sweet food, that's problematic. So everything in moderation, you know, it's not really anything new. We've known for a long time that we need moderation in our diets. Yeah. So cut back the sweet yeah. foods, what increase about, um, the fresh. Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, what about probiotic supplements? Like I know you've got me at the moment on like a – well, you probably remember what you've got me on. I just take it. <laughs> um, a probiotic. Um, but, yeah. Is that beneficial? Like why am I on that? I haven't even asked you. I just trust you and go, yep, I'll order it. <laughs> But why, why, and would that be beneficial for women who are experiencing thrush? Definitely. Yeah. Probiotics are transient bacteria that we put through our system that have an effect as it, they transit through. So you can take a probiotic. They're quite strain specific in their actions. So if you, we were taking certain probiotics for thrush versus um, IBS or other gut conditions, you'd probably choose slightly different probiotic strains. But just getting fermented foods in your diet on a bit of a regular rotation is a way of putting kind of good bacteria transiently through the gut each day as well. So this is where, you know, your kimchi or your kefirs or your sauerkrauts and yogurts come into play. You know, having a little bit of these types of foods in the Mm. diet each day is beneficial as well. You're putting good transient bacteria through the gut that has an impact as it transits through. So absolutely. I mean, Mm. I think that if people, you know, don't necessarily, if they're unsure which probiotic strain that they need to choose for what it is that's going on in their body, then they can get support with that naturopaths people in health food shops are well informed with that but even just getting good quality a little bit of good quality yogurt or some other fermented food in your diet each day is going to be supportive as well yeah so you wouldn't recommend necessarily going to like your local chemist or health food store and just grabbing any old probiotic off the shelf you're saying it's important if you can to get some professional support with what like firstly yeah being specific about what type of probiotic yeah why why am I on that one that you gave me just out of interest yeah so when we were looking at probiotics for you we chose strains that were specific to looking after kind of the microbial balance for breastfeeding specific so reducing the likelihood of mastitis and things like that for example so that probiotic strain strain um that we've got you on is more specific to like mums and bubs health because we know that there's some transfer that happens through breast milk yeah cool okay um all right well there's some good tips and i just recommend if you're listening go to a naturopath if you don't know who to go to look i would send them all to you kate but i know you're pretty um packed to the rafters with clients because you're so great thanks julia (laughs) um we'll talk about that in a minute (laughs) <laughs> find a naturopath and get some professional support you you can't do this alone like we're not all experts at gut health or we're not all experts at getting rid of thrush or whatever it's like yeah that support and it's so worth investing in i think that if there's really kind of more signs of complex stuff going on in the gut I would definitely seek specific support around that if you just want to go look I can improve my gut health here generally then you're more than equipped to go out and kind of make 
those dietary changes that are necessary. You know, really just comes back to the quality of the fuel that you put in your body and how your microbes are going to respond to that fuel. So, you know, I think it's also empowering for people to know that the impact of diet in what they, in how they can change their health. Not everybody's going to want to seek out a naturopath for that, but they can just start by doing that simple look at how diverse is my diet. Yeah, cool. Um, and another thing, I guess, that you mentioned was that our gut health impacts our mental health. Um, and then, you know, as a sexologist, I'm thinking, well, if our mental health isn't, you know, in tip-top condition, um, that can impact our sex life in a huge way. Um so why is it that our gut health impacts our mental health? Like why is that just because, yeah, why is that? It's because there's, I guess, the enteric nervous system there and there's this kind of bi-directional communication and there's a lot of serotonin production in the gut, neurotransmitter production in the gut. And, you know, oh gosh, there's a lot of factors, but... One of the things that you can look at as well is that concept of leaky gut, which means that you've got bacterial byproducts from the gut that can permeate the gut wall, get more into systemic circulation. And those kind of endotoxins can also influence like inflammation or neural inflammation as well. So, you know, there's a lot of people that are running around with lowered mood and brain fog and they don't always necessarily bring it back to the gut but that's just one classic example of what can be at play there and you know gosh there's a lot of things that again can impact the integrity of our gut lining and you know there's a lot of people out there with leaky gut unfortunately what what is leaky gut i don't don't, what is it it basically means that the normally the cells of the gut are quite nicely packed together, but when you have gut permeability, you get weaknesses in the gut junctions in the gut, and then you've got basically things which should be contained within your GIT can permeate through your gut wall and get into systemic circulation, and that poses a bit of a challenge for our immune system, and that's where this kind of hypersensitivities and immune component comes into play so a lot of food allergy can come or food intolerances um, immune hypersensitivity Mm. reactions so there's quite a cascade effect of things that can happen when the the gut is leaky is the best way to describe it yeah including an an impact on how we feel leaky gut yeah right they're pretty varied so just some of the real Right, okay. <laughs> if, if you've got, you know, where you feel like every single food that you eat has some type of effect on you, like the immune system has become hypersensitive. If, hypersensitive. Some people can get hives, skin rashes, atopic presentations, so things like eczema, dermatitis, psoriasis, those sorts of things. They're, yeah, there's quite, mm. <laughs> all have their roots in your gut health yeah so yeah yeah there's a lot yeah yeah okay i just had this memory it's so gross and i'm gonna share it come up share away i say to my clients Um, safe space (laughs) (laughs) well this is not so safe there's like thousands of people listening um (laughs) I, well, it's not about me, so I can, but I, years and years ago, oh, this is an example of why you need to have, well, this is an example of why gut health is sexy. I had this lover and he obviously had gut health issues. And one time he went to the toilet after we had sex and all I could hear was, like explosive diarrhea. <laughs> it's been years and years and years now, so I feel like I can share. I'm not saying names, so all good. Yeah. But that was 
the biggest turn off in history for me. Yeah. And I lay there and I thought, what the fuck is going on? Like the fact he's just cool about shitting himself on the toilet with me like three meters away. I He should have found the spare toilet like yeah. down the other end of the house. Secondly, like what's going on for him in mm. his gut? And I mm. instantly felt unattracted to him. In all honesty, in that moment, I was like, okie dokie. Like... Was that was a one-time thing. Not the right guy for me, but <laughs> yeah, I was like, "And we are done and dusted and clean the toilet bowl as you leave." But you know, yeah. this is why gut health is sexy because gut health really can impact our sex life. It well, really can. Like, think like about today, making out with you know, someone that's in so many ways. Yeah, think about making out with someone that's got bad breath odor. Really common sometimes in people that have gut, gut issues. Can you? can be i mean it can be a little bit about the microbes in your oral biome as well but yeah it's something again that i see clinically people come to me and they're like i've got this funky body odor or my partner says my breath has this Mm. particular smell to it you know so and you know that story about shitting yourself on the toilet I would say that actually probably a lot of people resonate with that unfortunately because a lot of my clients when it's quite bad they need to plan their day around their toilet stops and that's like so impactful on your quality of life like if you can't get through your day or get in the car and drive somewhere without having to know where your toilets are because your gut health is so imbalanced and your bowels are unpredictable so lowering their quality of life wow, and yeah. somebody with you know maybe that poor person that was being intimate with you was just sweating and praying that they got through that without shitting themselves so yeah <laughs> <laughs> i shouldn't laugh yeah i need to be more yeah well yeah and you know that's just one example like you say of many of how um it can just impact us in daily life and then yeah yeah, it must be really stressful to have the you know the possibility of that happening and then be with a woman or be with a lover and think please not now like i mean Our sexual health and intimacy, you know, this Jules, but it's so integral to also how well we are as a human, like all those different parts of our life. And if you're not having um, great sex and intimacy with a partner because, yeah, you're either feeling bloated or you're farting or you're not, your bowels are that unpredictable, like it's, Mm. yeah, it's Mm. worthy of. Um, investigation to to improve your quality of life to improve your sex life all of that yeah so gut health is sexy one last thing before we (laughs) gut health is sexy that's going to be the title of this podcast episode (laughs) one last thing i thought of when you were saying that was like anal sex you know if you if someone is a fan of anal sex or they even just want to explore it then the last thing that you need as uh in the in the like when considering anal sex is to want to shit yourself or feel bloated and uncomfortable or yep. um, feel like um, you might fart um, because anal sex is just so intimate and like yeah, you know, yeah, you'd literally putting something, most likely a penis, inside your anus and yep. what that does is it definitely ruffles feathers up there and can irritate, you know, like make your tummy afterwards feel a bit like, oh. Yeah, so well, you don't think about be, yeah. how that might be also infecting your, uh, affecting your microbiome health as well. So, yeah, there's lots to consider there, but yeah. definitely you're not going to feel really relaxed about putting something in that particular space if you're worried about what actually comes out of that space <laughs> like if you're going to fart or if you're going to yeah. do something that's yeah. you know could be deemed embarrassing in that really intimate situation yep mm. there's yeah. so much <laughs> well i think we covered a fair bit we've got people thinking that's for sure um 
So where can people find you? Can they find you or are you a bit of a mystery? Do you have a website? Do you ha- I know you don't really have social media. I know I'm terrible. Um, they can find me. Um, no, I, I love that about you. <laughs> I'm clinically, I practice out of Gould's Natural Medicine down here in Hobart in Tasmania. Um, uh, they can, yep, find me on the Gould's webpage there. They can ring the clinic. Um, yeah, look, I'm, I'm a busy lady and I'm forever grateful for that. But there's, there's always um, space for newbies as well. And, you know, I'm quite passionate about helping people live a better life. And the way that I do that at the moment is supporting their gut health and everything that comes with that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and you're just so great at it. You're so intelligent. You know so much and you're so holistic and you're just awesome. So, yeah, I highly recommend you as a practitioner. Thanks, Juliet. That's lovely. And um, kudos to you as well because, you know, your reach with your podcast, um, I'm 100% sure you're improving the sexual health of the nation, 100%. Yeah. Thanks. That's that's the um that's the goal. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Juliet. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Authentic Sex Podcast. If you love the show, please hit follow wherever you are listening and leave me a review. And if you really, really, really loved it, please share the podcast with your friends, family, and social media followers. Doing this together as a community, we can make an impact and support the world to feel more sexually empowered and free and just get the word out about these free resources. If you'd like to join me for daily updates and inspiration, you can find me on Instagram, which is at Juliet, J-U-L-I-E-T underscore Allen, A-L-L-E-N. And you can also head on over to my website to join any of my offerings, pleasure school the intimacy blueprint uh, and you can also treat yourself to the juliet pleasure wand at www.juliet j-u-l-i-e-t hyphen allen a-l-l-e-n dot com